Hi, everyone. Welcome. We are just going to give it a moment and let everybody get in. Those people who are not watching the football, we do apologize for that. And for those people watching the recording afterwards, welcome. We're just giving it a moment to let everybody in. Okay, let's kick off. Hi, Pauline. Hello, hello, Shannon. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us again today, or perhaps for the first time in the series. My name is Pauline Vermaer, Cultural Director at Magnum Photos New York, and with my colleague Shannon Gannam, Global Education Director, we are your host for the Beyond Magnum series. Beyond Magnum is an in-depth talks program created to explore some of the challenges facing our industry today. Through this series of free talks in chapters addressing archives, representation, and the future of photography, speakers will share thoughts and engage in debates across a range of issues. Each section will be led by respected figures from the photo world, and speakers will range from practitioners to academics to subjects as photographs. Recording from chapter one and two can be found on the Beyond Magnum page and on the Magnum Photos YouTube channels. And you can hear more from our president, Olivia Arthur, about the aims of the program in the first session. Some housekeeping before we kick off. Today's event is being hosted via Zoom webinar and you will be able to participate via the Q&A box. Please put in any comments, questions for our speakers or tech questions. We recognize that this series of events will likely raise more questions and answer them and that it is the beginning of a conversation. So we thank you for your contributions to that dialogue. You will be seeing more from us following this program as to how we will take that dialogue forward uh, for us as an agency and as part of a wider industry. I will now hand over to Anthony Louvera, who with Noel Flores Tear curated this chapter's conversations. Anthony will introduce our guests for this last conversation of this second chapter, Mark Stenquist, Julian German, and Tiffany Ferry. This talk will be followed by final comments by Noel and Anthony. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you all. Off to you. Thank you very much, Pauline. And, uh, and, and thank you very much, Julian, Tiffany, and Mark for joining us this evening. In recent years, there has been a surge of photographic practices and projects which are described using terms such as collaborative, participatory and community. In these ways of working, the photographer or artist is said to create or co-create socially engaged photography, collaborative photography, socially engaged art, or to use photography as a social practice. As new as these types of photographic practices may sometimes seem, Socially engaged photography can be seen to have arisen in relation to the work of individuals and collectives in the community photography movement of the 1970s and 80s in the UK and in many other countries around the world, the work of photography movement in the 1920s and 30s, critiques of documentary photography, conceptual arts, dematerialization of the object, as well as the long-standing practices of collaborative artists continuing to work today, such as Wendy Ewald, Suzanne Lacey, Deborah Barnt, Judy Harrison, Lorraine Leeson, and Peter Dunn, just to name a few. So today's final panel of the second chapter of Beyond Magnum on representation and self-representation is titled, Who's Looking at Whom? And it brings together three individuals who I believe have, made, have each made a significant contribution to the field of socially engaged photography today. What is at stake in the work they, will, they create and will discuss with us, and within this broader field of practice, is the way each artist has redefined their role as a photographer, and how this work proposes a recalibration of the power dynamic between themselves as the artist and the subjects of their work, and in doing so, how this work may have had or continue to have an impact beyond the gallery system. Indeed, in socially engaged practice, the word subject is often withdrawn altogether, and the term participants is used to describe the individuals, groups of people, and communities involved in co-producing the work. And so if socially engaged photography is made with and about the people taking part, we might ask, who is looking at whom? And how can issues of power, 
agency, representation, authorship, ethics and consent be addressed. Each speaker this evening has been asked to share their work for 15 minutes. We'll hear from all three speakers and then I'll join them in a conversation. Please do post your questions and observations in the Q&A box and we will do our best to address these too. I'd now like to invite Julian to join us. Julian Germain was born in London in 1962. He studied at Trent Polytechnic Nottingham and at the Royal College of Art in London. As a photographic artist, Germain is interested in the documentation of diverse social groups and in the notion of the amateur. He often uses vernacular archives, vernacular photographs collected from archives, catalogues and family albums, lending his work an anthropological quality and indeed it can be seen to reflect on photography's place in society as well as recording the passage of time. His first book, Steelworks, considers the impact of post-industrialization in, in a northeast English town. Baby, Baby, Baby is a collection of images of newborns from 1906 to the present day. War Memorial presents photographs made by British soldiers and sailors over the last century. And the exhibition and book Classroom Portraits features large format portraits of classes of school children from more than 20 countries around the world. Since 1995, he has been working alongside the Brazilian artists Patricia Azevedo and Marilo Godoy on a number of cooperative photography projects with groups such as favela communities and street children who produce the imagery and participate in, the, in its dissemination themselves. Proceeds from the book No Mundo Maravilloso de Futebol finance the construction of a library and community centre and the No Olho da Rua Collective has specialised in bringing imagery made by these marginalised groups directly to the public in the form of posters, newspapers and flyers displayed and distributed on the streets of the Brazilian city Belo Horizonte. A series of 18 zine publications from the extensive No Olho da Rua archive accumulated over 25 years is currently being released on an occasional basis by Morel Books. In 2014, Germain set up the Ashington District Star a free local photographic newspaper for the ex-mining town of Ashingdon in Northeast UK, run with an editorial team of local people seeking to creatively explore their everyday surroundings. Apologies for the many uh, uh, mispronunciations of some of the words in your bio, Julian, but thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for inviting me. And um, I'm gonna uh, try and whiz through uh, some of the projects I've worked on over the years. I'll just share my screen. Here we go. There we go. So just to give some background context and to go back about 100 years, actually this is uh, 1990. Uh, this is the book steel works that Anthony mentioned. And uh, I just want, oh, hang on, let me just uh, play. There you go. This is the book steel works that Anthony mentioned that featured my pictures alongside uh, uh, all sorts of other kinds of imagery, uh, press images, uh, local press images, family snapshots, things that I found uh, in the local community there. Um, I didn't do this for, I would say, a conceptual reason. I think I did it for a practical reason. I just sort of found that this would be a very useful way of telling the story. <clears throat> Although I think in retrospect, it was quite a new approach in 1990. I continued to use this kind of methodology in my next book, which was about uh, football called In Soccer Wonderland. This book is almost a collage of my pictures. This is one of my pictures um, and also found pictures, press images, snapshots, images taken by uh, sort of uh, working professional photographers and so on. And um, my Steelworks project was uh, exhibited in Brazil as part of a show about uh, uh, British documentary practice. And when I was there, I did some portfolio reviews and I met Patricia Azevedo <clears throat> and I'd never seen any work like hers. The top piece that you can see there is one of Patricia's collages. And she was collecting and finding archival images as well as making pictures of herself and making these collages. Uh, which I thought were fantastic. And her partner, Marilla God Marilo Godoy, <clears throat> um, is a graphic artist, really. And, uh, and he uh, has a particular interest in uh, 
vernacular signage, hand-painted signage, which is photographed all over Brazil. And so we had this connection um, and, uh, and we just knew that we wanted to work together quite quickly. And that opportunity came along because the British Council asked me uh, after that visit to Brazil to make some work about football while I was there. And uh, I visited uh, Patricia Murillo in Belo Horizonte and I made some work there. This is in 1994, I think. <clears throat> Um, but we also spoke to the uh, local community, in particular, a guy called Adjilson, who uh, ran the local football team and the kids' football team. And, um, and we talked to him about doing a project where we wouldn't be collecting photographs so much as generating it, giving cameras, uh, especially to the children, but also to uh, the women's football team and asking them to make pictures themselves. And, um, and at that time, I was aware of Wendy Ewald's work, but I wasn't very aware of um, other projects that may have happened before then. It certainly, that kind of work suddenly, certainly wasn't very much part of the conversation. And again, I don't think I really did this for conceptual reasons as such. I did it because it seemed to be an interesting way of gathering material. <clears throat> uh, that was another one of my pictures there from my first visit. And I went back to Cascaglio a few months later and with British Council support, um, we gathered all these kids together and we basically gave them cameras and asked them to go and make pictures. Actually, on the first day we arrived, they, um, they expected us to turn up with a coach and take them to somewhere exciting, somewhere interesting, maybe even a professional football stadium. But uh, we weren't interested in that, of course. We just said, no, we're interested in you and where you live and where you play football. And so they went out with cameras and uh, as soon as the first roll, I mean, there are about 50 kids involved and about uh, 12 to 15 ladies from the football team. And as soon as the images were coming back, we were getting things that I'd never thought of photographing. I'd been photographing soccer for several years and I'd never made a picture just of the ball going up towards the sun, for example. And for me, or well, for us, this was a very exciting experience to have images that we couldn't really possibly have expected, <clears throat> um, just being aesthetically beautiful as well as somehow fitting in with the theme of the kids' own love of the game, because they all love football in Brazil. And of course, the reality of life in the favela also comes through in the pictures. And of course, in a process like this, you get accidents, and accidents are often part of the beauty of a project. So this is the end of a roll of film, and uh, you get this weird sort of tear of the film at the end, which looks like red grass. And also, I think one of the interesting things for us was that they clearly set up pictures, theatrically arranged pictures. They had ideas and then brought them to fruition successfully. And, uh, and that went very well. And, and actually uh, that work was exhibited um, in, as part of an In Soccer Wonderland show that I had in Sao Paulo and, and Rio. Um, and the following year, we went back and we, we, we decided to make paintings, partly because we didn't then have the money to use photography, but uh, we thought it would be interesting and we thought we could involve all and ever more children that way. And so these are some of their paintings. It was very chaotic. Paintings could be made very quickly in a matter of minutes, but they were drying all over the place. I even spotted a painting drying on a horse. And then we had an exhibition at the local cultural center. And then we were now by now very interested in the idea of producing a book. And for a book, we felt we needed text. And so some of the participants uh, wrote very nice pieces of text. 
indeed including uh, the introduction to the book which is uh, very beautiful i'll just very quickly read uh, the very last sentence it is a great honor for us to tell our history in a book where our lives can be read and reread by a lot of people in this story made by all of us together we dug a lot of things out of the trunk and there aren't any really big lies everything that is written here is what we've been told and most of us believe that even the legends are true after all, so many incredible things happen in the world. And this collective text was the cut and paste job uh, where, where kids would, uh, would go and ask the oldest person in the favela about how the favela began or go and get some stories and they'd come and they'd bring just a couple of lines along and eventually it was cut and paste into this collective text. We were able to then, because it was football, we were able to sell those images to various magazines like Heprol, The Independent Magazine, Sir Deutsche Zeitung, L'Express Magazine, raise money. And with that, we made the book. And this is the launch of the book, Back in the Favela. And with, tho with that, uh, working with a couple of other local organizations, we built the Library and Community Center very complicated process that whole thing took about eight years i needing to rush on though as soon as we got good pictures from cascalio you know even then in 1995 the very first time we wanted to go and uh, try and work with street kids uh, and we knew of a couple of uh, locations where street kids hung out and so we just went and met them and we gave cameras to three different gangs, uh, in, in total about 50 people. And again, immediately we got pictures that we were inspired by. Uh, we, we, by now, were dumping our medium format cameras and using the same point and shoot cameras that they were to take pictures ourselves. And our pictures um, are included in the No Oliveru and No Mundo Maravilloso de Football archive. And quite often, um, you know, sometimes we knew who was responsible for the camera. Um, at other times, we just knew that it was a camera belonging to a group. And so in many ways, we don't know the whole context behind some of these pictures. Um, but in other ways, it was very, fascinating and very exciting that uh, all these cameras were out in the city and pictures were being made. Uh, and actually in the group sessions, when we met up with them on the street, we had no nothing like a classroom. There was nothing as uh, organized as that. It was total chaos, really. A lot of noise, a lot of excitement, um, but a thrilling time. So this is some of the, some of the kids when they got their pictures back sharing them out we realized that it wasn't very much very important to them who took the picture what mattered to them was who is in the picture so they had kind of different ideas of authorship it took a long time for us to think of a outcome for the work with uh, the street kids uh, with in, in, in Cascalio, in the favela, it was a strong community and uh, you, could, you could talk things through in a calm way with people uh, and uh, sort of plan things. But with, with, with the street kids, it was, it was much more complicated to find uh, a sort of way forward that would, that would be appropriate and, uh, and that they could agree to because there were three different gangs and what have you. Uh, so we started using notebooks and we came up with the idea of fly posters uh, that would be glued to the walls, one and a half meters by a meter in size. And we sort of like did a mini edit and then we and then we showed the pictures that we were interested in. This was a picture that we were interested in because back then they all uh, sniffed thinner. And this was a sort of like a bumper pack of thinner uh, that the kids would uh, soak on a rag and, and, and sniff. But they, did, they, they didn't want this to be a fly poster. They didn't want bad stuff to be on a fly poster. Equally, they didn't want to be recognizable on a fly poster. Um, they didn't want their faces to be on a fly poster in, in, in general. 
the only one uh, that was uh, the exception was this picture of Heidi on the left here. Uh, she loved this picture of her pregnant, um, amazing photograph. Um, and uh, and she she agreed to have that as one of the fly posters. But you can see we we got agreement for this uh, for this Disney castle to be a fly poster. So we sort of had to go away and have a rethink about uh, the sort of things that we could turn into fly posters. These were the ten images, and this was a trip with Ellis Angela and. Um, I've forgotten this kid's name, uh, to, the, uh, to the printers to see the fly posters being printed. Preto is his name. And this is Alessandro and Preto gluing fly posters to their shack. They didn't feel safe gluing them on the streets. Um, they thought that the police would, uh, would, would, would rough them up. And so they didn't uh, fly post the pictures actually on the streets. They did come and see them on the street. Uh, but uh, but they did get involved in fly posting where they were living at that time. And after that, we continued with the project over the years, occasionally going back with cameras and meeting them uh, again and again. And this is one of Marillo's pictures. This is one of Sandro's pictures. This is a girl called Rosemary, who was particularly interesting. She did little projects, you know, whereas most of the kids tended to photograph just what was happening around them in the present moment. Rosemary went off, and did little projects. And, uh, and we have things in the archive now like damaged prints, which we would just find on the floor. Uh, we would find pictures from our project just lying around. Very difficult for them to keep things and, and over the years, um, the drug of choice changed from thinner to crack. They still get washed. This is a boy called Marcos. It's very interesting. He photographed himself with people like us. That's him in the middle. And this is Murillo recording the kids' opinions and uh, thoughts, He's got a notebook under his arm. Notebooks are very important to us. Uh, 2007, we made a newspaper. And this is the newspaper being distributed on the street. And this was fantastic, giving the, the kids a fantastic opportunity. I know I've got to hurry. Giving the kids a fantastic opportunity to meet the public and the public to meet them in a kind of different context. And you can see this is Ellis Angela here engaged in a really intense conversation with a chap at a ca and in a cafe in Belo Horizonte. Again, pictures of the newspaper. And again, sometimes these accidents are really nice. And then now, over the years, we started to think about much more in terms of uh, the project as an archival project. And our archive is not organized well enough yet. And we're, and one of the reasons why we're doing this series of books now is to help us get the archive properly organized. Because, you know, we realize now that if it's properly organized, we can get find things like this. This is Biu and Giordana, uh, you know, many years apart. This is Biu's, uh, he's interesting. He, he has some photo albums like this with pictures from the project over the years. This is a girl called Patricia when she was what, 14, 15 years later, 16 years later. And this is Heidi and her son Felipe, who's in her left hand on the picture on the left. And then because it, once, it's, once you have it um, properly archived, you can find things like, you can, you can make a portrait of just images, you can make a book of just images of Heidi, for example. So you saw that image earlier of Heidi and this, and this one. And this is so interesting. Look, it says Heidi film image of Heidi. This happens so much in our archive. You know, the reference we have for who made the picture is, well, who, who had control of the camera is Heidi. But then the images on the film are mostly of Heidi. 
Who's actually pressed the button? We don't know. And actually to them, it doesn't matter. But in Heidi's films, there are many portraits and uh, she's obviously thinking about them and performing for them. And you, when you look at a picture like this, you think how intelligent is that? How meaningful is that image? And so very briefly, uh, we had an exhibition in uh, uh, at Fabrica in Brighton, and we managed to get about 120 rolls of film uh, properly archived and properly boxed. And then the images that you see on the wall on the right, uh, they're all a sort of selection of images. The selection is made by us, but there's a reference number there. And the roll of film that those images come from is in one of those boxes. And so the audiences, can then explore those boxes and they can kind of make their own edit and they can kind of think about the editing process. They can, you know, it sort of like raises the question of authorship, I think, as a, as a way of presenting the work. And then here are uh, some of these uh, zines published by, by Morel Books. This is the first one, it's a series of portraits. This is just a way of introducing many of the characters involved in the project. The second one was edited by Martin Parr. We are having some guest editors um, and uh, more guest editors will be announced soon. Because we think that it's interesting if guest editors have the opportunity to look at the archive and, and interpret it perhaps in their own way. Uh, we fully intend for the participants themselves to engage with uh, editing one or two issues as well, but uh, with the COVID situation as it is, it just has not been possible to organise thus far. So the whole, the whole series of publications is sort of been on hold for several months now. Uh, it was launched at the Martin Parr Foundation in Bristol. That event uh, incorporated uh, a choir made up of people who are homeless or had been homeless, also by uh, an organisation called the People's Republic of Stokes Croft, who uh, were running a project called Street Stories and, and monologues and interviews with uh, homeless people were read by the audience members at that event. And, and we're, well, the intention is to have other live events as additional zines are released, but obviously live events have been off, uh, off the rails of late. Uh, this is number three, it's called Dogs and Other Animals. The kids love animals, they have many pets, and so that they feature very strongly in the archive. Likewise, there are a lot of pictures of people sleeping, and that was number four. So I'll leave it there and um, hopefully um, speak again later. Thank you very much, Julian. That was a really wonderful uh, overview of, of, of the work. And I, and I really appreciate that. I look forward to joining you in conversation with, uh, with Tiffany and Mark in a moment. So I'll now Thank invite you. Mark to join us. And Mark Strandquist has spent over a decade using art to amplify, celebrate and power social justice movements. The immersive exhibitions, interactive photo-based photo public art and multimedia projects he directs has hel have helped advocates close a youth prison, pass laws, train police officers, and connect the dreams and demands of communities impacted by the criminal justice system with tens of thousands of people. His work has been exhibited in museums, galleries, and universities, as well as through parades, church basement, legal clinics, and illegal wheat paste installations. He has received multiple awards, fellowships, national residencies, and reached wide audiences through the New York Times, The Guardian, NPR, The Washington Post, PBS, BBC, Vice, and many others. He founded and currently co-directs the Performing St Statistics Project in Richmond and Virginia, and through fellowships from A Blade of Grass and Open Societies, he co-directs the People's Paper Co-op and Reentry Think Tank with his partner, Courtney Bowles. In response to the COVID-19 public health crisis, he founded Fill the Walls with Hope, Rage, Resources and Dreams, which installed thousands of posters on boarded up buildings across Philadelphia and co-directed the People's Paper Co-op's campaign to use art to bail out black mothers and caregivers, 
raising over $160,000 in art sales. Mark, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we're all looking forward to hearing about your work. Thank you so much, Anthony um, and Noel and everybody um, at Magnum for hosting this um, amazing conversation. Um, it's been like a crazy long week, so I apologize if I'm more scatterbrained than normal, but I'm super honored to be here. And yeah, um, so I'm gonna and try to condense it to 15 minutes or less, but um, I wanted to talk about a couple long-term projects as well as um, some very short-term ones to sort of showcase a variety of collaborative strategies and practices that I use in my work. Um, and like, First and foremost, well, I'll share my screen first. Um, so you can see some of the rad folks I get to work with. Um, I can co-design virtual reality films, but can never figure out how to actually um, present these things. Anyways, um, so at the core of my practice um, are, I'm gonna start with a couple quotes. Um, this one from Martha Rossler. Um, I oh, wonder what, well, oh yeah. If you go to view, you might be able to, um, to the menu view on the left. Oh, look at you. Oh my gosh. Is that better? Uh, try, try it again. Oh, look, I tell you what, if that's going to be too tricky, just it's great as you are. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. Um, so this one from Martha Rossler, I wondered what role images can really play in the promoting of acceptance of others, which we have little real life experience. We've gotten well used to images of others without necessarily seeing them as us. And for me, like, which I'll sort of showcase through the work, a lot of the work is not only collaboratively creating um, images with a variety of communities, but um, the communities that I'm working with are then in control of how those images are seen, are, are distributed, um, are themselves the curators, the docents, the advocates that are using those images. Um, and, and we use our exhibits to not just uh, transform, you know, hopefully stereotypes and replace them with uh, narratives that, that communities are, are, are crafting themselves, um, but using those ex installations, exhibits, parades to bring a ton of people together across difference. Um, and also just thinking about this moment and just really, I love this, um, this quote from Ruha Ben, I mean, just remember to imagine and craft the worlds you cannot live without, just as you dismantle the ones you cannot live within. So really thinking about um, photography and art as, a, as, as not just a powerful tool for um, showcasing uh, the problems of society, but of imagining and articulating and uh, illustrating ways forward um, alternatives to these systemic issues we're going through. Um, so whether uh, within my work I'm creating, working with folks to create monumental scale uh, portraits um, that uh, weave together uh, photography, film, virtual reality, animation, augmented reality, interactive installations, um, or working with folks on a very smaller level to create uh, protest tools that they bring into city council chambers or use in protests or turn into billboards, um, or creating very intimate um, practices that um, folks can really in very one-on-one -on -one, um, private spaces destroy uh, materials, uh, stories that have been leveled against them and to transform them like these criminal record paper sheets um, into canvases to rewrite their narrative. Um, throughout the work, you know, I'm, I'm using a variety of, of strategies um, and I'll sort of showcase a few of those um, right now. Um, so performing statistics is based in Richmond, Virginia. Um, uh, where I work with young folks who are uh, currently locked up um, in juvenile uh, detention facilities, um, as well as young folks coming out. Um, and the entire project is about looking at young folks as experts and using a variety of uh, photographic, film, um, and sort of public art strategies to, to amplify their dreams and their demands for a better world. Um, so throughout our work, you know, for making a film, they are the directors, the writers, the uh, storyboarders, the actors, um, and we are connecting them with a variety of um, oftentimes sort of adult mentor artists to uh, really amplify their voices. Um, one thing I love to think about with photography is that it can create an incredibly flexible 
like almost like a hyper object where the image you make with a young person can be transformed into posters, into t-shirts, into billboards, into banners, into wheat pastes. Um, and having young folks see how powerful their voice can be, how powerful their stories, how powerful their dreams can be um, in all these different mediums. You know, it, for us, we want them to fall in love with the power of their voice and then to connect them as they get out of detention with a variety of mentors. Um, our installations, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning, sort of, I, I really think about photography as a series of stages. You know, you have your design, you have your production, and then you have your distribution. And each of those stages have a ton of opportunities to bring folks together across difference, um, to uh, sort of have them see how powerful they can be. And then also this distribution moment where you get to really reach hopefully broad and strategic audiences. You know, for us, we make our installations um, interactive um, uh, so that folks are not passively keeping back from the work, but have to physically engage oftentimes with the actual um, stories. Uh, this is the visiting booth with photographs we created with young folks that you actually have to press their hands in order to, to play audio. Um, and if you let go, the audio stops. So forcing you to sort of sit with them. Uh, this is the chief of police going through a virtual reality film we created um, with young folks. Um, we use our installations like classrooms. You know, I think like a lot of exhibits can be incredibly powerful, um, but they oftentimes have um, self-selecting audiences. So how do you ensure that you're, you're, if you're, if, if young folks in, in my project are vulnerable um, and brave enough to share their stories, how do we ensure that, you know, the responsibility of, of ensuring that their work gets out to the right people um, and actually has a deep impact. So we've used our, our exhibit to train hundreds of police officers, social workers, teachers, politicians. Um, one strategy we, we use to kind of get out of that self-selecting audience is, is we bring the art to political spaces. This is um, on the left, an installation um, uh, outside of the state legislator in Richmond, as well as you know turning photographs that we make with young folks into t-shirts and printing hundreds of them for parades and protests, um, literally creating people-powered art exhibits um, that, that use the art as tools for amplifying their, their dreams of, of abolishing these unjust systems. Um, we've been uh, recently during COVID, um, we created a couple of public art projects I'll highlight. Um, this is the Freedom Constellations mural that um, I created with a, a group of amazing young folks and my friend Kate DeCicio. Um, the mural is, this is Tadrima here, one of the collaborators. Um, is a, a mural that imagines a world without youth prisons. Um, there's augmented reality and QR codes baked into it. So you use your phone to, to hear directly from the young folks who created this. Um, but what's most important, or one of the most important things to me is the location of this mural. It's across the street from the VCU police station in Richmond, which means that every single day they look out their windows and they see powerful, um, uh, young leaders who are, are literally dreaming to put them out of their business. Um, We've created digital web experiences and you know all kinds of photographic posters and stuff as, as part of that um, work. And we're about to launch a um, hundred uh, an install that includes two 170 foot tall banners. Um, this is Tadrima and CJ um, on the side of City Hall that you'll be able to see from miles away. And when you hold your phone up to their portraits. Um, your phone will, will, will play augmented reality animations that play in the clouds over City Hall. So, you know, in this instance, uh, you know, especially in Richmond where we've had such a, you know, complicated and toxic history and racist history of how public art and monuments um, can be used to um, really, you know, A, just lift up singular problematic voices. Um, but that this having youth speak about abolition on the city's biggest billboard, aka its main municipal building um, for six months means hundreds of thousands of people see this, it means every single high school is doing field trips there. Um, it means we're able to really, you know, start to replace these racist monuments with the kinds of monuments that the city needs the most, ones that um, actually include the voices of many young folks that are dreaming of a world without youth prisons and a, a world where young folks have what they need to thrive. Um, so this is a good example of, you know, the young folks in this program 
they created the storyboards for this. Um, you know, they designed their, po their, their, their poses. They wrote, we collect collectively wrote poetry with young folks around the country for this. Um, and so my role is, is, is almost like the, you know, I'm the photographer, you know, and I'm helping them sort of craft their narrative. Um, but it's really like creating a set of processes for them to kind of lead um, and then connecting them with amazing animators and you know other folks who can can make something of this caliber actually happen so this launches july 1st this is just a mock-up but um, and there's cj into dreamo um doing a quick time check so i'm going to talk about a couple other projects real quick but you know i think as as we're thinking about or as i'm thinking about sort of these projects like you'll see things that are hyper intimate that force the viewer to get really engaged as well as those that are you know hyper public and and i'm always thinking about you know if if i want to reach the police if i want to reach politicians if i want to reach other young folks you know then we cannot expect them to go to the museum or to the gallery um, we have to find ways to strategically get get the work to places where they will want to be, will 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 go frequently and actually engage the work. Otherwise, I think we're just patting ourselves on the back, and you know I don't think that's these issues are too urgent. Um, so very quickly, uh, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about the Peel's Paper Co-op, which is sort of combining um, creating cohorts of formerly incarcerated um, men and women in North Philadelphia to co-design um, projects and campaigns. So this is a legal clinic that we created together where we, we made empowering posters that sent messages to their neighbors about, you know, why records shouldn't hold you back, criminal records shouldn't you hold you back, and then connected with lawyers to actually help people clear their records. Um, and then after a person cleared their record, if they were interested, they could take their records, tear them up, put them in a blender, make a paper smoothie, which does not taste good, and make a blank sheet of paper out of their um, old criminal record that they then embedded um, a, a new Polaroid portrait where they sort of articulated how they want to be seen and wrote about um, how the clearing of their record would free them to live their future uh, dreams. Um, this became a larger project um, where we work now, my partner and I work with an amazing group of women in Philly each, each six months to do different um, campaigns. Uh, always using sort of that criminal record paper to create posters, create artwork, all sorts of things. And this work is, you know, iterative. So the act of destroying something is healing. The act of reclaiming your narrative is healing. But then what do you do with that art? So we then use that art to actually raise tens of thousands of dollars. We've raised a hundred and over $160,000 to bail out Black moms um, over the past couple of years. We bring the art then to the jail. So it's having these many lives. You know, the art is healing for the creator. The art literally frees people. We then bring the art to the jail to create a pop-up art installation outside of the jail to welcome the moms home. And then we bring that same art down to city hall, turn them into banners, into parade props um, for protests and, and call for an end to cash bail. Um, we use, you know, not only, you know, we use many different forms, again, like creating things that are hyper uh, flexible, you know, that, that, that can be turned into murals, um, that can be turned into, into billboards, and that can be set up as banners in a multitude of spaces. This is in a, a church where we got hundreds of city officials, formerly incarcerated women, activists, allies, all coming together, using the art to create that space. Um, you know, to center their voice um, and 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 dream of you know what the city could do to change uh, to to truly support women. Um, I think I'm at time, um, so I'll just quickly go through this last project. Um, just did this with a group of former life sentence women. Um, this is Paulette uh, here, who served 41 years. Um, we worked with the women to create a monument um, at the Village of Arts and Humanities in North Philly that imagines the day that all of their all their sisters that they grew up with. Paulette was 16 when she was locked up and, and sentenced to life. Um, so herself, this is Ivy, um, and many of the other women, their star, we created this monument together that dreams of and imagines the day that all of um, the women that are still locked up are free. Um, it's interactive with QR codes and you can hear each of the women um, describe their, their, um, their dreams and their vision. Um, and this piece, you know, it's, 
a, a lot of the pieces, you know, I think there's a strategy to call in at art for many reasons. Um, but, you know, it's, it's gotten out there in the press a ton. BBC is about to do a big thing on it. So like having these sort of using the spectacle in a way to really ensure that the work is getting out there, that the voice is getting out there, that their advocacy is getting out there um, has been super helpful. Um, and I'll stop there. But, you know, I hope that what you see is that um, none of these projects, they require deep partnership, deep trust, and that, you know, for me, what's almost most important is who's in the room when we're, when we're first starting and how are we building collaborative teams that are trauma informed, that are co-led by peers that, you know, are not just extracting stories and then, you know, calling it collaborative. And, and, and for me, I just, you know, I, I just love to think about like each of the, the phases of that photograph, the design, the production and the distribution and thinking critically about each of those phases and how we can, there's opportunities to make those more collaborative, more politically powerful and all these things. So um, sorry for that was a little bit of a ramble, but it's been a long week, um, but I'm excited to be here. Oh, that was anything but a ramble. That was such an inspiring, well-articulated uh, talk about what I know is just the tip of the iceberg in your practice, in your collaborative practice with Courtney and your collaborative practice with all the many different participants, community stakeholders and partners that you work with. So thank you very much for that. It was deeply inspiring. And I can't wait to speak more with you about it when we rejoin with Julian and Tiffany. I'd now like to invite Tiffany to join us. Tiffany Ferry is a visual sociologist based as a Leverhulme Research Fellow in the Department of War Studies at King's College London. She has worked for 20 years with participatory photography and media as a researcher, practitioner and educator. Her current Leverhulme research project, Imagining Peace, sorry, Imaging Peace, explores the role of images and image making in building peace and dialogue. In recent years, she has undertaken research on arts-based peace building with art and reconciliation and changing the story. Tiffany is a co-founder and was the director of Photo Voice from 1999 to 2009. She's been involved in over 40 participatory photography, photo voice and digital media projects with communities and partners in the UK and internationally. Tiffany also works as an advisor for projects and organizations with participatory photography, including everyday peace indicators and voice of freedom. Her work has been recognized with various awards, including the Royal Photographic Society's Hood Award, Hood Medal for Outstanding Advancement in Photography for Public Service. Thank you very much, Tiffany. We look forward to hearing about your work. Thanks, Anthony, for that intro. Um, I'm gonna just put my clock on to make sure I don't waffle on. Um, let me find and share my screen. Um, here we go. So as Anthony has mentioned, I'm going to, um, I'm currently based as, oh, what have I done? Excuse me, let me just get this up. Okay, so I'm going to be talking today about um, my current research uh, fellowship, which is a Leverhulme funded um, research project that's looking at the critical and neglected relationship really between photography and peace building. And the search is really considering the role that images and image making play in building peace and dialogue in societies with recent histories of uh, violence and conflict. Um, and I'm specifically looking at how socially engaged participatory and dialogical community photography practices have been in uh, harnessed with intention to support healing, rebuilding and reconciliation of communities and people who have been affected by violence. So I've been working with various photographers and organizations in a number of countries um, and, and who do this kind of work and building case studies and undertaking action research on photography projects and initiatives that can be understood and designated as forms of peace photography. Um, so the history of photojournalism and documentary photography has been defined by iconic images of war. And these images spin to all of our imaginations and serve to remind and educate us as to the horrors of violence and conflict. Um, we celebrate the work of the great war photographers and there are exhibitions, books, films and volumes of research that focus on war photography. The critical literature has extensively considered photography's fixation and even collusion um, with conflict, suffering and atrocity. 
sorry, I can't find, oh, here we go. Um, photojournalism assigns priority to representations of conflict rather than peace. And more often than not, peace in documentary photography is understood negatively as an absence of violence and is referenced by focusing on the horrors of war and the legacies of suffering for victims. The problem with this approach is it tends to strip people of the people depicted of agency, designating them as victims by only representing peace, uh, sorry, peace through the prisms of war. Photography contributes to the invisibility of peace. It reinforces the idea that conflict and violence are inevitable. Peace photography in contrast to war photography doesn't exist as a concept in the professional discourse of, on images. But in recent years, a number of thinkers have pushed us to consider the question, what might a photography of peace consist of? I'm interested in contributing to this new agenda for visual peace research, which Frank Moller describes as thinking with and about photography and with photography about peace in a way that challenges established limits of both representation and visibility. So a more concerted effort to explore the relationship between photography and peace feels particularly urgent given the extent to which political spaces and histories are constructed by means of images, the meanings of which are constantly being renegotiated and reappropriated and are often harnessed to fuel division and to stoke conflict. So a genre of peace photography doesn't yet exist, but I propose that it's one that, uh, it, that urgently needs to be willed into existence. Understanding of what peace photography consists of depends, of course, on what we meaningly for, meaningfully construct as peace photography. What do we want to designate as worthy of consideration? Researchers to date have focused on aftermath photography and professional documentary photographer and artist projects as examples of peace photography. But in my mind, a vital aspect of what is what it consists of has been overlooked, or rather, it's been briefly pointed to but not seriously considered. This is the role of photographic practices that seek to enable conflict affected communities to become the agents of their own images, to self represent and tell the stories that are important to them as they recover, rebuild, and cultivate peace. So, I want to take you on a whistle stop tour of some of the very plural and participatory forms of peace photographies that I'm, I'm talking about, particularly the ones that I've been working with and, and, and looking at. Firstly, in Rwanda, um, I've been working with Jacques Nikingzabo. He's director of the Kigali Center for Photography. Um, and we've been thinking about his community photography work and photo mentoring work operates as a form of and a model for visual peace building. So this image is of a homestay exhibition. In homestay exhibitions, young photographers who have been participating in Jacques' photo workshops and mentoring programs um, host exhibitions of their own photo projects in their homes. And this is in a context where since the genocide in Rwanda, many families have closed their doors to neighbors as communities where victims, perpetrators and bystanders are often living side by side have endeavored and often succeeded to reconcile, but also struggled to rebuild trust. The homestay exhibitions seek to open the doors and using photography to share stories and start conversation on issues that the young people deem as very important to Rwanda's present and future. Sharing images and starting conversations in the intimacy of their homes, the young photographers want to nurture and encourage dialogue with their families and between their neighbors to get people talking and exchanging about the issues that are affecting their communities. This last year, Jack and I have been continuing, Jack has been continuing to mentor some of the young photographers who have been planning, adjusted for pandemic conditions to hold more homestay exhibitions. So one of the young photographers, Delphine, has been working on a project that he's titled Masculinity and Family. With his pictures, he wants to talk about what it means to be a man. He wants to show and celebrate how men work hard to support their children. He wants to demonstrate what men can do when they're not consumed with being macho, but rather focus on building their families. In considering these projects, I'm often reminded of the Wem Winders quote, the most political decision you can make is where you direct people's eyes. When people have charge of the camera, they they get to set the parameters of their the story. They get to choose where to direct people's eyes and to define the conversations that are important. From within Rwanda, there is a call for the country to be known as something, for something other than the genocide. Young Rwandans have many pressing concerns that relate not only to remembering and learning to the country's past, but also to its future. With the homestay exhibitions, the focus is not on the images themselves, but rather what the images do, the conversations they can start. And in Delphine's case, this is about what it means to be a Rwandan man and how these conversations can help to build and strengthen community relations that nurture sustained and, and peaceful coexistence. 
a focus on the process of making images, on the doing of photography of the image products themselves as a defining characteristic of, of many forms of peace photography. This stands in contrast to the traditional forms of photography that are concerned with images themselves as icons. While the resulting images, of course, have important roles to play, it is the process of making the photographs that builds the agency, dialogue and critical engagement that are the vital ingredients of peace. The focus is not so much about representing peace, but about using the process of images, image making to shape and nurture it. So when Jacques and I were talking about the work of mentoring young photographers and what it involves, he used a phrase that I've heard from many other photographers engaged in this kind of work, which is that, that this is about so much more than photography. Delphin's images may not be obviously about peace, but his photographs and their process of production and how he uses them to start a conversation with his neighbors are everything to do with how dialogue and peaceful coexistence is realized. So the next project I want to look at is in Colombia. It's a project I've been involved with over the last year, year and a half, working with the Peace Building NGO Everyday Peace Indicators, or EPI, to integrate photo voice methods with their participatory indicators process. The project has been run on the ground by the Colombian cultural workers in the picture, um, the photographer Edwin Cubillos and the actress and theatre worker Manuela Munoz. Um, so photo voice is a popular action visual research methodology used in the social sciences in which people use photography to identify, discuss, reflect on, document and communicate the issues that are important to them, often in relation to a particular research theme. In a context where um, external experts are often getting to define the problem and indicators of success, EPI uses a participatory process to work with communities to identify indicators of hard to measure concepts such as peace, reconciliation and coexistence. And these community generated indicators are then used to assess changes in peace and conflict in the localities and their tracking is are used to inform, design and monitor and evaluate peace, peace building interventions. So EPI decided to integrate photo voice and photography into their participatory indicators process to give communities more control to shape, refine and expand the stories that stood behind the indicators and to communicate them to audiences. So the thinking is that the two methods would amplify and complement each other with participatory indicators producing robust quantitative concrete measurement data that's of interest to the policymakers, and photo voice generating a platform for community dialogue and action. So the EPI project is happening across three, three regions of Colombia in multiple communities, with photo voice workshops happening in six of those communities. Um, with pandemic delays, we've worked in two communities so far. So there was, there's an open invitation for anyone to join and photo voice groups are, 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 are intergenerational and have been made up of participants from age from eight years old to 56. The photo voice process runs over five to six weeks with twice weekly workshops and the core of which participants and in, as individuals and as a group choose specific um, indicators of the community generated indicators to develop photo stories around. The workshops culminate in public exhibitions with the images strung up throughout the village, creating as one participant called it an open air museum, peace museum. So peace is of course context dependent. What to observers might seem to be a non-event, just something every day and mundane may actually be an event for the people depicted. The possibility for a routine, relatively peaceful everyday life without immediate danger or consequences. Moller has noted that non-events tend to escape from representation, but they're the stock of amateur photography, amateur photography. And having worked with participatory photography projects for over 20 years now and watched their reception by the photography world, I have seen how it could be this mundanity Sets of amateur images focusing on the everyday are not often seen as that particularly compelling and are easily neglected. But in these images, the photo voice participants make visible their, the everyday ingredients of peace and coexistence. People getting on with their lives, committed to living together rather than describing to dynamics of violence and division. They show the day-to-day -day challenges they face, the barriers to peace that still remain, and they define their priorities. So, the state of the cemetery, which had fallen into considerable disrepair, had been an ongoing concern for the community that we worked with in San Jose de Orama. And the photo voice group chose as their collective indicator story to undertake an extensive documentation of the cemetery's um, dilapidated state, which you can see a single image of on the left. Um, but during the editing and discussing their images, the group decided it was time to do something about it and called a village-wide work party. So over two days, 80 people came together to clean up the cemetery, as you can see in the image on the right. And in this case, photography kick-started the community to take action about an issue that had long been a concern and directly bolstered their sense of purpose, pride, and identity. 
and they wanted to see that their dead, their dead were properly honoured. So in this last project, we're going to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, the Post-Conflict Research Center, which is led by Val Masaryk, um, a former journalist, is a peace building organization which intentionally harnesses creative multimedia and storytelling to cultivate an environment for sustainable peace. So since the war, ethnic divisions in Bosnia remain high. Various versions of history exist and the past is a highly contested platform around which enduring negative stereotypes and constructive prejudice of others are based. Youth are particularly vulnerable in this environment and PCRC projects seek to counter what they see as some of the key barriers to durable peace, namely an excess of polarizing and negative media that reinforces division, a deficit of positive Bosnian role models, and a prevalence of social influences that ingrain and perpetuate negative perceptions and attitudes towards the other, others. So they do this by creating projects that foster tolerance, moral courage, and positive change. They create professionally produced documentaries and public photography exhibitions, as well as providing training and mentoring to young Bosnians to create their own media and stories that are disseminated through exhibitions, publications, such as this youth um, culture magazine, ASBO, and their online platform, Balkan Discourse. Over the last seven years, they've been nurturing and growing a countrywide network of youth correspondents and photographers who are producing a raft of social stories that provide viewpoints on society, culture, and politics not found in the mainstream media. This brief presentation can't do justice to the wide body of visual work that PCRC have been involved in producing, but I want to highlight one recent project. So, Love Tales tells the stories of couples from across Bosnia and Herzegovina who are in successful inter-ethnic inter relationships. Much like PCRC's flagship program, Ordinary Heroes, which uncovers the stories of ordinary Bosnians from all ethnic groups who risk their lives to save people from ethnic groups that weren't their own, Love Tales seeks to challenge the ingrained narrative that real connections between Bosnia's ethnic groups are unattainable. The images and interviews are undertaken by PCRC's youth correspondents who actively seek out stories from their communities that contribute to more inclusive and shared understanding of their country's past and future. PCRC's work lies in mentoring and building the capacity of young Bosnian change makers, providing them with the skills and networks to take charge of and share their own stories, stories that counter the persistent narratives that young people grow up with in school and through the media, one-sided accounts of history, division and violence in which other ethnic groups are vilified and conflict appears almost inevitable. The idea is to inspire that peace is possible. And the importance of this cannot be underestimated in a country where young, many young people have become disillusioned and cynical, struggling to build lives in, one, in a country with one of the world's highest rates of youth unemployment, where corruption is rife and the economy is crumbling. Even long after the guns have been put down, peace might not seem like a reality for many. And Jean-Paul Lederach, he's one of a leading peace theorist, talks about peace as a potentiality that requires the creative capacity to imagine, to take risks and to recognize possibilities. In surfacing and curating images and stories that make peace and coexistence visible, these young people are willing into existence a vision of their country that disrupts and counters the dominant narratives of division, suspicion and mistrust. Photography isn't only about what is seen, but also about what goes unseen. And we need to ask why peace has been so invisible in photographic representations and discourses, especially when there are examples of people in countries dealing with legacies of war and violence who engage in what Rich Hume refers to as a form of proactive photography that is purposefully har harnessing, sometimes explicitly and sometimes in impl implicitly, that is harnessing the participatory and performative potential of photography to spark dialogue, to to nurture and embed peaceful relations, to realize agency and community priorities. This pushes photography beyond its representational function. Images and encounters through images that seek to drive and nurture dialogue and build opportunities for connection are generative. They help to make the world they seek to create. These projects are often overlooked in part out of a latent value judgment over what kinds of photography and photographic activities are valid and interesting. There has been an important critical debate about the ethics and manipulation of participatory photography initiatives that point to the fine lines between modes of collaboration, exploitation and co-optation and suggest that it's often the organizers rather than the participants who drive and benefit from these initiatives. However, this work must not be dismissed. We cannot lose sight of the fundamental importance of what's in play when people get to self-represent 
to decide where to direct the cameras and to, to, find, to define what is worth looking at. If we do, we're in danger of missing the huge piece potentialities that photography holds. And that's it. Tiffany, thank you so much. Such a, an incredible um, body of, of work really, uh, created across countries with a number of partners uh, that, that you're kind of involved with, which is, is, is super interesting and, and a really kind of rich addition to the discussion this evening. Could I please invite Mark and Julian to, to join us in a conversation between the four of us and which we'll then open up to the audience as well. So I'd like to encourage each of you to, to, you know, to kind of share your observations and questions with each other. But I, I thought I'd kick us off by, by just sort of um, sharing some of the things that I heard this evening, which really kind of struck a chord with me. Um, Mark, you said that, you said at one point that one of the things that you want is for young people to fall in love with the power of their voice. And I thought that was such an evocative, uh, really evocative kind of statement. And, and Tiffany, at another point, you said that this is so much more than, this is about so much more than photography. And I think that's kind of in a way sums up the point of this panel, which is to kind of think through together the ways in which a photographic practice can be so much more about, be about so much more than just photography, just more about uh, images and image making, but actually how images and image making can play a role in real world, uh, in, in impacting the real world. Having said that, uh, it seems to me that there can often be a tension in, in socially engaged practices uh, like ours. And I have to sort of throw myself into the, into the ring here because I'm not, uh, I'm not a kind of, you know, just a, an impartial observer here. As a practitioner who works in the same kind of field myself, I'm, I'm kind of thinking through these questions as much as I'm throwing them out there. And I suppose what I'm getting at here is that there's often a tension between the process of making the work and then how this process is described and, and then how those artifacts or products that are created through that process are, are shown to audiences. And in some respects, then the role of documentation in a socially engaged practice becomes particularly important for, for us practitioners. And, and these, this, this form of documentation, I mean, this evening is a form of documentation, you know, artist statements, other forms of writing, digital platforms, documentary film, public speaking engagements, media, um, that's generated uh, and, and the other sort of various texts which serve to account for the process. But in describing this process, as each of you have done very beautifully here today, I can't help but be aware of the fact that any description will be reductive to some degree and won't fully account for the layers of dialogue and the many contributions of all of the individuals involved in the making of the work and even the tensions and challenges that were encountered along the way. So I wonder what each of you think about this and how you navigate the potential blur of your intentions for the impact or outcomes of the work and the ways that the work is actually experienced or makes an impact in the world, but certainly actually experienced by the participants and how the participants might communicate that experience. Feel free to jump in anyone. <laughs> well, for us, for me and my colleagues, you know, it's always been, uh, particularly with the No Olio Darua project, um, very complicated. You know, I mean, Tiffany mentioned all of the ethical issues, which we all know so well around dealing with subject matter like, like this. And, and in a way, our whole process as a team of three people is a constant um, discussion about, is this the right way forward? Um, what should we do next? How should we approach it? Um, and we, you know, it takes a long time, you know, so for example, the exhibition that we had at the Fabrica Gallery where um, hopefully we managed to present the people who came to the gallery to see the work with uh, not only a flavor of what had been produced um, and what the editors, now in terms of that exhibition, the editors were us and we openly said that we had made that selection of 40 or so images. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we were grasping for a way of um, enabling 
the audience to the exhibition to experience what we experienced uh, in terms of uh, looking through potentially all of those pictures and thinking about and then being able to see the choices that we'd made and critically analyze them if they wished also to see everything so basically we were um, in principle offering the work unedited you know so to take that out of the equation you know so um yeah i saw that exhibition and i experienced that exhibition firsthand and one of the things that i was really struck by was precisely what you said there was kind of forcing me as the audience to be almost sort of faced with the conundrum of the sort of ethical responsibility of handling a collection of photographs made by other people in terms of making a selection and then thinking through what that then says about the kind of depiction of the individuals or issues that related to the people in the pictures. Um, so that, that's a really that's a really interesting um, point that you raised there. But just coming back to my question a little bit more concretely, Mark, can you speak a little bit about how you've kind of enabled the participants that you work with to kind of give an account of their experience of the making of the work? Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of that comes from I mean, there, there's like the sort of like larger documentation of the project. But there's also like where do most people see it, which is in person. And, and I think like, you know, we were talking the other day about previous exhibits we've done where we've worked with young folks in the system to create the content. And then when people come there, um, they're actually, they're, they're, the, they're not just the docents, they're sort of like the guards, but they've created these new uniforms that are all about freeing youth, not incarcerating them. And, and they're, they're leading you through the process. And so literally shifting the power dynamic within that um, experience. Um, and with all of our work, like we try to ensure that like <sighs> the BBC is about to do a piece on it, on the monument project I mentioned at the end there, like we, Courtney and I, you know, we're not trying to <laughs> speak, it's their, it's their experience, it's their story, it's their dreams. And so we worked with the producer to really like have and, and, and Paulette Starr and Tamika and Ivy to really craft what that piece was. So they're controlling the narrative, they're controlling how they want people to see this, um, this monument, um, as well as sort of like when we're thinking about, you know, I do really believe that, that, that the process is deeply political and that as artists, we need to be transparent about that process for a million reasons. If for no other reason than we want other people, if we believe in these, practices, we need to be able to share that. We need to share our, our failures, our struggles, our, you know, the beautiful moments that happen. Um, and it's hard with funders because being vulnerable and being truthful makes it complicated. It's hard. Um, there's well, so it, many, it's, it's, it's complicated. Like you speak about funders, Dad, and that kind of sort of neatly segues into another question that I have for you, for you all actually is, and I, I'm really keen to hear a bit more about how, from each of you, about how you've been able to navigate successfully or otherwise the agenda of the organizations or institutions which are somehow involved in the practice either through funding commissioning or supporting or making the work that you do happen and how this agenda has either inhibited or enabled the expression of agency by the participants or by you as practitioners Well, quite a bit of funding seems to me to be tied to an agenda of relentless positivism, you know, uh, at the moment, uh, which I'm a bit suspicious of, personally. Um, that's, that's one element. Um, we've also felt uncomfortable about crowdfunding, uh, for example. So we have... Um, uh, taken funding uh, from a few organizations only on a few occasions only and most of what we do has been self-financed although outcomes have always been supported. So the, the organizations that you've selected to... Um, to, to I wouldn't to, say we've selected them, some of them have, have actually approached Okay, us. yes, yeah. Um, but others have, have come up in conversation, but I don't think we've gone to, but if organizations have come to us and been interested, then it's obviously more easy in the first place to, to have that conversation. Yeah, I mean, I'm really interested here in how, you know, although in, in a practice like, uh, the, you know, the, the various organizations and photographers that, that, uh, that you're working with, Tiffany, within the practice uh, of, of, 
of your own as well, Tiffany, but also all, all of you, Mark, Julian, how, you know, there may be a, a time, a particular moment in the practice, or it might through throughout the whole practice where the kind of power dynamic between you and the, the participant is kind of evened out and, and the participant is really enabled to express their opinion, their voice, their perspective, their wishes, ambitions and intentions for the work. And I'm curious about what might happen when organizations or institutions that are involved in the practice can somehow kind of impinge on that or affect that or even conversely enable that? Um, I, it kind of relates to your first question a bit. I found Mark's, um, you know, the three stages, the design, production, dissemination, like a really useful framework because yeah. I think key to these kind of processes is ensuring um, it, it's about it's about kind of participation at all stages and levels and then actually a lot of it's not that these power dynamics go away those tensions never go away they're just part of the practice and they become in a way less tense does that that make sense when there's everyone when people participants are actively involved in disseminating their own work and presenting their own work to public audiences um, there's less of an onus or, or as as a kind of organizer or facilitator or whatever you call yourself the responsibility is is it's not that it's less yours but you, 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 the tensions are, are different, I guess. So in the, a lot of the projects that I'm talking about, young people are using their work to speak to other young people. People are speaking to their own community. So the, audi the immediate audiences are their immediate communities. The, this work isn't being made for an institution in another country or even an art gallery in their own countries. It might find those kind of audiences, but the young people, that it's initially, its initial purpose is very much for an audience that those young people are seeking out themselves, particularly in the projects in Colombia and Rwanda, and actually in Bosnia, all three of those projects. And it, it, the Bosnia project's a bit different because they have an online platform where they're publishing work online, um, and as well as uh, having public exhibitions. Um, but I think that that changes the dynamic considerably. And um, I've obviously been doing this work for a long time and have worked with a lot of very different funding streams and institutions and um, I'm now more the projects and work that I'm working with you is the money might come from a more kind of NGO or particularly peace building um, donors who um, they're it's not that they're less interested in the images but again they're interested in the process and that really helps <laughs> yeah. in terms of some of those tensions because the, the te I think the pressure comes when there's a, over, an over interest in the image products themselves yes in that within their own right rather than the participants and the processes that these um projects are actually concerned with and that what they're really about well, so, absolutely. and i suppose in some ways that a part of the point that i'm trying to get across here or get to to think through with you all is is how very often you know the kind of um the the, the parameters of the making of a particular project Will still will still be, or the, the the kind of the invitation that's issued to the participant will still be designed by the artist, will still be thought through by the artist, often prompted by uh, a commissioner or or an opportunity uh, to to access a particular piece of funding or support uh, or you know any kind of opportunity, and, and and too often I think that the um you know the the kind of formulation of of the project, the design of the project. Uh, doesn't involve the participant right from that early, earliest possible stage, or does it? I don't know. This this is the question I have for you: is is how, how, how does that how can that happen? I mean, with the street kids, I mean that was done. We went off piste. We had some support to work in the favela, which was an organised situation, uh, a, a sort of solid community where you could have a meeting with fifty people, uh, and we. Uh, use some resources that we had set aside to, to work with street kids, which was a completely different situation, totally chaotic. And essentially, we kind of put cameras in there with no idea what was going to happen. You know, uh, we just had this feeling that they would um, enjoy photography and they might see it as an opportunity, but we had no idea you know uh, and so we did we we had we weren't thinking of an outcome at all we were just 
um, basically trying something out at the very first instance, you know. And, and how about you, Mark? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I was thinking, so, I mean, for a lot of the young folks you work with, I mean, you know, they've been told through the architecture of their public housing, through the literal way in which police treat them, through the way their teachers may treat them, that their voice doesn't matter, that their life doesn't matter. And so, you know, I think we've seen over almost a decade of these workshops that like these, we use somewhat structured, like the projects have a structure. It's super open. Like we're doing a film for the Smithsonian, this exhibit that opens in November. Um, it, the only concept that we put in, the, in, in place was like, we wanna make a film about the future where no youth are locked up. How we get from that initial prompt to the end, is completely, completely open to the young folks. But like, if I do think that it's useful with some folks we're working with to like, for them to see, it's, it's iterative, I guess is what I mean. We'll do a photo project. They see how powerful they, their voice, their, their image can be. And then that's the building block to create a more complicated, a more truly, you know, completely collaborative process. So I think that we use art practices as vehicles to get to the place we want to, but we also acknowledge that um, young folks are the ones we're working with are coming into the workshops with all kinds of, you know, it, it's just, it's it's more complicated, I think. And I think that um, who's in the room too is huge. Like we have formerly incarcerated peer mentors. We have former young folks we've worked with in past years come back to be leaders in the workshops the next year. So they're seen from every stage um, that, you know, they're represented in a million different ways already from, from Go. Yeah. But one of the things that I really appreciated about um, a, a term that you use, Mark, is hyperflexible and how you want to, how you, how you sort of see photography as being this hyperflexible medium uh, and how it can be used in a number of ways. One of the things that I'm sort of noticing uh, across everyone's practices, really, uh, and when, I, when I'm referring to, to Tiffany's uh, presentation, I suppose I'm also thinking, uh, thinking a little less here um, about, about the practice. I'll, let me just think, let me rephrase that. Often there's a distinct aesthetic in, in, in the work that we see. Um, and certainly in, in Mark, in, in your work, there is a very distinct aesthetic. And so I suppose, um, and you know, that can come across in, in the way that specific images have been created, composed, selected, or combined with other images and texts, and how then those images will communicate specific information by and about the participants. So, in some ways, this does to me appear to be the result of both the contribution of the participants, but also you as creative practitioners. And so I'm kind of curious about how you kind of navigated um, or how you navigate the kinds of decisions that you feel are important for the practice aesthetically um, and, and also uh, any kind of participants wishes or requests that you feel that you aren't able to support or agree with. So how do you kind of navigate that conversation about driving forward the practice to achieve the aesthetic results that you want it to achieve? I can, I can go first. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like clearly different, pro every project has like a million different, like in, our, in one summer of workshops, we might have a radio piece, a film project, you know, a photo installation, the mural that we showed across from the police station, that was like the final project after weeks of doing all these smaller bits. And, you know, I think that we, the portraits, you know, we're sort of constructing them with the young folks in a way where we're asking questions like, you know, what kind of leader do you want to, to be seen as? Are you like uh, the, a fighter who's fighting for, for justice? Are you the thinker who's coming up with the master plan? Are you like keeping people together with your heart? And they are creating sort of poses based on that. So certainly like I'm taking the photo, Fuji, thank them, gave me like a crazy medium, digital medium format camera to use for this project. So like, they're gonna look very clean, um, but that's also like what, the young folks are asking for and, 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 and hoping for and what's resonating with them. And like when we went to the opening, it was like of that mural, like seeing like hundreds of people and mostly their families and friends, like they were so proud of what they created, not because I took their photos, but because they designed everything else within it. Um, because there was videos that they created, radio pieces that were totally their own aesthetics and um, visions that were baked into that. So I think I think 
you know, for us, we are trying to, we're trying to end youth incarceration. We're trying to end these policies and, and different projects. So communicating those, creating sort of visual cam campaigns and strategies, it's essential that it's getting to a variety of different audiences. Um, and some of this is about code switching and, and working with young folks to, to think about like, well, how would you communicate to a stodgy old white male politician in Virginia in the racist South? Like, how do you sort of communicate these radical ideas in a way that's gonna cut across, you know, difference? And sometimes, you know, that does mean that like we're, there's a lot of cleaner design elements to it um, or that it feels like a campaign, but that's strategic too. So it's just like different projects, I think require different strategies, so. Super interesting. And Tiffany, I, when I began to articulate that question, I sort of realized it was a slightly sort of, it kind of slightly flew in the face of one of the most important statements that you made, I think, which was that um, there's much more of a, and in this, re, in many respects, applies to what Marcus just talked about too, which that the focus is not so much on what the images look like or what they show, but rather what the images can do. And so, but within that, there's still a, a kind of visual language that's being communicated. And I wondered what your thoughts were, Tiffany. I think one of the key, another key word that Mark just used was this kind of idea of strategy is really key um, in these projects. Like the visual is being employed for the purpose of other things, <laughs> you know, like, it, you know, in Mark's case, he's talking about, um, you know, ending youth incarceration in the projects that I'm looking at, it's very much about um, supporting a community to rebuild, to talk with each other, to make connections to. And, and so um, of course, organizers and participants are gonna work together to do that, to you know, kind of harness aesthetics to do that in a way. But just because maybe an organizer or the mentor, whoever it is, might bring in some of their visual knowledge to support and work with communities to do that. I, I don't find that that problematic as long as the communities want that and they're working with that and they're part of those decisions and then they actively are making those decisions themselves. So, you know, again, Mark's point about iterative projects that like none of these projects just happen. The images don't just happen. The communities are often working over time. They've done this iterative process where they've explored and gained confidence themselves as image makers, you know, with the, a project in Colombia, there's two or three projects that the participants have done before they do their indicator photo stories. And um, going back to your earlier question about, you know, kind of opened or closed. So like the case in Rwanda, which those projects have, you know, really minimal funding. There's no particular theme or subject. The participants, are, the young people involved are totally free to choose whatever story they want to choose. And there is more, I find it more interesting when stories come up that um, you need to work with young people to maybe really think about how they want to vocalize and speak about it. So for example, one young man was wanting to, is looking at teen youth pregnancy. Um, and he was, he's a man looking at it by taking portraits of young girls who have been pregnant. So there's all sorts of conversations we've been having with him about how to do that appropriately and think about himself as an image maker and you know, all these other things. And that's partly as well about kind of working um, alongside participants to think about how they're harnessing the image, to think about how they're telling their stories and, and tell, it's about defining your story and defining your voice that, that we all do, you know. Um, so yeah, I kind of lost the point of the original question, but I think that the, I, I have no problems with imagery being used strategically and aesthetics being used strategically. And that's what these projects do seek to do. And, and, and so they should, I guess it's about um, whether that is being done in the kind of, you know, like, I can't remember who it's said by, but when these projects become like ventriloquism, you know, and then, and it's essentially the organizers and the artists or the, whoever, the NGOs behind it talking, you know, using um, communities as puppets, that's when it's problematic. Well, absolutely. And, and I think often, you know, um, the, the, the danger with socially engaged practice is that, when, when the practice is communicated to audiences that weren't involved in the making of the work, that the kind of line between what the artist intends the work to do and what it actually does as told by the participant can be vastly different. Um, and, and so that's, that's it's a really interesting uh, kind of range of points that you've, you've kind of brought up there. With, with, the, with, the, uh, with the street kids, they um, saw the book from Cascalio 
and they wanted a book like that, which is a nice hardback book, very beautifully printed. You know, that to them was an object of beauty and, it, and I think it symbolically represented a world that they are completely excluded from, you know what I mean? And in fact, they were disappointed um, that they only had a newspaper, for example, in a sense. But we, you know, we were able to, to point out that, you know, we couldn't afford to give newspapers to people, you know, and so, but I mean, it is an ongoing challenge for us to, to make a book. These zines do not cut the mustard for them. You know, they want their work to be presented in the most beautiful way possible. For them, it gives it importance. It's a world that they're completely otherwise not part of. Absolutely. Well, it's been such a pleasure hearing from each of you and and just what I think really is just the beginning of a conversation and uh, and and I'm afraid that we are we're out of time and I can see that Shannon and Pauline have joined us. Have um, are, are there any questions from the audience that we ought to um, bring to our speakers? We do have a couple, but I'm, I'm conscious of time. So maybe we'll just take one. Um, uh, one from Ellen. Thank you, Ellen. Um, and actually maybe in uh, the two questions, um, in one question we can cover both. Um, curious about um, uh, image copyright, consent, um, consent by photographers on how they, their images are used, whether photographers are re remunerated, the word I can't say, through the sale of their images. And that's also for that was for Julian, but that was also uh, for Mark in regards to how you're fundraising through through that collaborative work and navigating all of the issues around that. Well, we, just in terms of us, we um, haven't had a situation with the work in, in, in Cascalio, um, images were sold to magazines specifically to pay for the book book sales specifically were used to pay for the library so that so the relationship about the money was transparent and absolutely clear um, we have not um, had any commercial use of the street kids work we, we didn't do crowdfunding for example because we felt uncomfortable about selling their images so we haven't really I mean, in terms of copyright, it's it's obviously a very confusing situation because in that work, you don't even know who's pressed the shutter much of the time, you know. So it's, it's a complicated issue. Yeah, for us, I mean, it depends on the project, different sort of structures for each project. For the People's Paper Co-op, it's a paid fellowship. So the women we're working with, um, it, we collectively write a contract together that feels right and, um, all of the proceeds from what we create, 100% of it, we don't keep any of it, 100% of it goes to bail moms out for Mother's Day. So, you know, we women are paid for their, their for their, for all of us are paid for our time. Um, and you know, we've raised over $160,000 with those photos and t-shirts and posters and stuff for the bailout. Um, same with like the Smithsonian project we're doing this summer with young folks, it's, you know, it's a paid job, it's a summer job for the young folks to be part of this collective. And um, so, you know, I think like where it gets more complicated is like what happens with these projects five, 10 years from now when they're being archived and put in collections and, or, you know, if, if they are, hopefully. Um, and so who benefits then? And that's, I think we're thinking a lot about that. Um, we're talking about creating sort of a culminating exhibit for the co-op with a book and stuff and thinking of ways of, former fellows could be brought in that process and paid for their time and brilliance and um, work. So I think it's it's like a, it's an ongoing, like those questions are, you know, we also have social capital that you that, that are hard to like enumerate and all these things. So it's, it's complicated, obviously. Brilliant, thank you. Tiffany, any learnings, quick learnings from you over the years on that subject? Uh, um, 
Oh, where to start? It's a conversation that we have. From, I mean, it's not so much relevant to the work I'm involved in now, which is more research based. So there's not often very any kind of commercial sides to it where images are being sold or anything. But the, the key thing for me is a photo voice is just, yeah, that conversation has to happen from the outset. It's about kind of managing expectations, having it as an open discussion very much. I mean, things around informed consent and having really open conversations all the way through these kind of staggered versions, processes of consent, where copyright and ownership are very much part of those conversations. I think Mark's point about the long-term archive is crucial because I've seen, having been doing this work for 20 years, I've seen kind of um, what happened, you know, these archives, which no one's interested in for a while, suddenly do um, get revived. And um, it's not so much there about commercial, things it's much more about obtaining consent for the work to continue to be used um, uh, increasingly I've seen strategies where people use things like creative commons licenses um, but the, the big issue with this work and I, that this is what I much more put my em the emphasis on now with when I'm working with communities is saying from the outset to communities that it is hard to control this work and when they are deciding to participate there is an element of um, and the fact that anyone who puts the pictures out into the world can't control where they go. So it's a, that's what part of the informed consent process is really about, that they um, are happy to put those images out into the world, knowing that, um, knowing, yeah. Great, thank you so much. Anthony, any cool. final thoughts? I look, I, I really, um, there are so many thoughts that I'd love to, to continue to exchange with Tiffany, Mark and Julian, but I think the best I can do at this moment is to thank them all from the bottom of my heart for taking part this afternoon, or uh, this evening, um, and uh, depending upon where you are. And, and I really appreciate the work that you do. And, and I, I, you know, I, I wish you all the very best and, and look forward to continuing the conversation with you as you carry on that work. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you all so much for being here with us and for sharing your work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And you're welcome to hang around for Anthony and, and Noel's um, closing remarks as well. Thank you so much for your time. So Thank we you. will invite Noel back. Hello. <laughs> hello. Hello. How are you, Noel? I'm doing well. That was fascinating. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, Mark made a beautiful zine for a symposium that the Nagman Foundation put together in 2017. And it's called Starting with Questions, Not Answers. It's a brilliant piece of writing and I'm hoping that the foundation is able to publish it to make it more widely available and maybe like even expand it and include, you know, um, Julian and Tiffany potentially and Anthony uh, in the project. Really brilliant. Thank you all for sharing your work. I'm so pleased you you um you brought that up, Noel. And and I you know it's one of the I've, I had that I have that zine in my studio here, and it's always sort of near me. But whenever I want to find it, I can't find it. But I know it's going to be somewhere just behind. <laughs> the uh, format is like it slips between books. It's, uh... I, really, I really appreciate that zine. But Noel, tell me tell me about your kind of uh, your recollection, your kind of thinking you're kind of uh yeah you're you know i it's been an in, yeah it's been an amazing couple of days i feel like um a lot of kind of ground was broken i think we brought together a lot of people that historically you know you you know their work in the ether and then all of a sudden you know they're dropping gems everywhere um so i'm really it was really an honor to be here and um and i guess maybe my one takeaway i'll keep it short but just this question of um, the self and this question of reflexivity. So I, I feel like for me, the theme that I've picked up on a lot in all of the panels is, um, you know, it's about really understanding yourself and doing a really strong analysis about your own ethics, what drives you, what drives the work and openness and willingness to um, engage in collaborative practices and this question of represent representation. More and more I'm realizing it's about starting with you um, in the in a kind of anthropological self ethnographic way that I think um, is a really healthy it's a really healthy thing and I think that's what I've been really interested in all of the presentations from the individual practitioners to the institutions like the self is an embodied it's present it's 
it's ever present, even in kind of collective work. And I think um, being transparent about that is really key and really important. So that's my, I, that's my big, uh, that's what I'm walking away with. Yeah, that's, that's a really, really kind of, um, I, I totally agree with you. I think it's a really powerful takeaway, this sort of sense of self-reflexivity, thinking carefully and critically about what we do and the kind of power that we, uh, we hold when we do it uh, as photographic practitioners in the broadest sense of the word, whether we make photographs, whether we're involved in writing or thinking about photographs or organizing institutions and networks that promote the use of photographs. I think for me though, I mean, it's been such an incredible few days and, and just you know, being witness to some of the exchanges between people like Susan Masalis and Laura Wexler between people like Mark Seely and um, Shahidul. I mean, there've been so many kind of uh, incredible contributions, but for me, uh, there were two things that were said by Agatha today, um, Agatha Kay, that really stuck with me. And I think for me, they kind of sum up everything that I hope that self-represent, sorry, on-representation and self-representation could do. And, and she asked the question, what is the responsibility of the photographer towards the group, a marginalized group or the people they photograph? And she said afterwards that, uh, that they have the responsibility to join the fight, their fight for the visibility of their struggles and for their justice. And, and for me, I just thought that was such a, a kind of, you know, a kind of crystalline summing up of, 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 of what, what's actually, you know, what, what is inherent in, in the kind of uh, responsibility that, that we involved in the photographic medium have to the people that we take pictures of, um, or all the issues or the things that we take pictures of, is that we, we can't just take the picture and walk away. We need to kind of walk the talk and, uh, and, and follow it through. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Pauline, any thoughts like from- to make a 11th hour experience. <laughs> No, I, yeah, I would just like to say hello to your daughter, Noel, first and foremost. Hello. Um, but also, yes, accountability and uh, what is the use of the image after it's been done, right? And what, what can be done in the most thoughtful manner? I think Agatha made a good point earlier also about photography as evidence. You know, we have explored, I think, through this chapter, the many uses of photography from, you know, memories as simple as that or uh, reflection, self-reflection, self-representation, representation of, of uh, uh, underrepresented communities. But I think what really struck me uh, when I get, I was talking earlier was that idea of responsibility of the photographer and, you know, what does it mean to be the witness? And here I'm talking as much about political um, than personal photographs, you know, and um, this really is something that this is the one conversation that I'd love to continue and that we will continue. Um, you know, I'm thinking about Gilles Perez's photos of Bloody Sunday and what they were used for in those trials after to prove that the citizens were not armed, for instance. You know, what is photography here for beyond the beauty of the act itself, of being there in the world and being in history? What is, what is the photograph, you know, what is it for? And I think this is a very important question. And maybe something for me, um, uh, thinking about that and thinking about the legacy of, of you know, Magnum, of Gilles Perez, or maybe Philip Jones Griffiths, and the photograph as evidence. But coming back to something that Tiffany was saying, I think the visual serving a purpose, and then to think about Mark's work and that concrete outcome impact, which is what we're all, you know, hoping that the work will be able to achieve so that's um and then just finally mark again just um flagging that idea of helping people fall in love with their voice what an incredible incredible statement so nice way to end i think yeah thank you all so much and thank you anthony and noel for leading this conversation so beautifully and to opening it up to so many voices um mark julian and tiffany thank you so much for today's talk and it was a beautiful way i thought to end and to showcase the you know i mean the rich the rich ways in which and the many ways in which we can engage with the world and um and try to change things modestly but yeah with strength.
and respect. Thank you so much. And also it just makes me think of one other thing of us, Susan and, and Laura and that incredible uh, presentation around collaborations and what an amazing collaboration process this has been with you guys. It's been such a pleasure. Um, so thank you, Anthony and Noel. Thank you. It's, it really has been a pleasure. And, and I, I look forward to, to seeing the third chapter of Beyond Magnum. And, and I congratulate Shannon, uh, Pauline, and all of the Magnum team for, 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 for the production of Beyond Magnum. And, and thank you for involving me in it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bravo. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. A third chapter to come starting on June the 28th with Fred Richin and Sarah, uh, Zara Rasul. And we look forward to it. It will be about the future of photography. And we hope to see um, everyone there. Have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you so much. Bye. Bye.